it is hard to talk about Israel without using superlatives and of course without entering into debates. There is one thing, however, that everyone agrees upon. Israel's technology scene is an incredible success. On a relative basis, Israel is by far the highest than any other country with approximately $500 per capita venture capital investment. That is double the US figure and about four times higher than the UK itself. But also on an absolute level, Israel has been for many years the highest in Europe. And only last year, the UK was higher than Israel with Israel second. Germany was third. The Technion is probably the most important contributor to that success. Seven out of 10 of Israel's founders are Technion graduates. And not just Israel's. Today, we're having our meeting in Zoom, an American company. Our license has been donated to the Technion by Zoom's chief product officer, Odette Gall, a Technion alumnus. Our goal today is to inform you, inspire you, and try to help you decide on your next academic and career moves. Careers are becoming difficult. Even the word career, career itself is a little too old fashioned. There are so many options. Some seem distant and almost impossible to achieve. Today, we have three amazing speakers. I will introduce them to you without giving you all the details of their numerous awards and accomplishments. You can find them on the internet. So we'll have more time to talk about their lives, the choices they made, their work, and why it can be so much fun. We will even cover a topic involving squishy fingers for delicate deep sea marine biological interactions. But this is a surprise, I'll leave it for later. Before going to our panelists, I would like to invite our co-host, the UJS president, James Harris, to say a few words. Here's to you, James. Thank you very much, David. And uh, I'd like to thank Technion UK for allowing us to partner with you. Um, and it's so great to welcome so many students, not just from the UK, as I understand it, but from around the world, uh, such as friends from Greece, for example, uh, to such a unique event. And uh, this, it, this really is my first public event as president of the Union of Jewish Students. And we are the, really the voice of uh, eight and a half thousand uh, Jewish students across the UK and Ireland. Uh, we're so proud to support Jewish life on campus, whether that be in person or on Zoom, uh, as we are this evening. Um, and we'll always be there for Jewish students. And this is such a great opportunity to partner with, with Technion uh, on this event uh, to engage the future leaders of STEM, of science, technology, engineering and maths. Uh, and, you know, those sorts of connected fields uh, with just a few of the incredibly talented uh, minds in Israeli high tech. So with that, I will turn my camera off because I'm sure you would like to see our panelists a lot more than, than my face and I'll hand you back to David to introduce our speakers. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, James. It's a pleasure to, to meet you also. Uh, technological success has not brought only prosperity, but also it has brought security to Israel. So our first guest is Iriti Dan. Irit is the first woman to head the R&D of Rafael, a global leader and one of Israel's most important defense companies with amazing scientific achievements since it was formed in 1948 by Ben Gurion himself. Rafael is the company that developed Iron Dome, a system that intercepts and destroys short range rockets and artillery shells fired from distances as short as four kilometers determining first if they're heading towards populated areas. Quite fittingly, Irit started her journey from the stars. As a child, she asked a very basic question, what is behind the stars? She then became, not in, you know, in a few years, it took some time, I suppose, uh, an accomplished astrophysics scientist with publications relating to black holes, star evolution and eruptions and nova. In addition to science, Irit plays a very peaceful instrument, the harp. So here's to you, Irit. I'm sure we'll have very interesting things to hear from you. Thank you, David. And hello, Technion UK and UJS. I hope you can see my slides. Is that okay now? Yes, 
All right, so let's start. So David said a few words about me, so just let me add to that. I got all my three degrees from the Department of Physics uh, in the Technion. I served on the Board of Governors of the Technion and on its council. I'm married to a Technion professor, and our children are Technion students as well, so we are a Technion family uh, all together. Now, after graduating from the Technion, I joined Raphael, as David says, a theoretical physicist, and as of 2017, I'm the Executive Vice President for Research and Development of Raphael, an amazing company that I will show, talk about later. I am the first woman in the defense in industry in Israel to serve in such position uh, in the Israeli companies. I'm in charge on Raphael internal R&D and its budget. And it's my responsibility to choose the future technologies that the company will need in the short and long term. Now, Rafa is the third largest defense company in Israel, and we have a worldwide reputation as being a leader in developing cutting edge solutions for the defense market. We are well known for our systems such as Iron Dome and Trophy that was used by the Israeli Defense Forces and the US Army. And Three weeks ago, we learned that the British Army also chose Trophy to be part of its Army defense system as well. So I'm very proud to be here today. Well, as you can see on the slide, just a couple of months ago, the Forbes magazine chose both Iron Dome and Trophy to be in a short list of the 12 most important new weapon systems of the decade. Well, it's a huge honor for both Israel and for Rafael. Well, like David says, Rafael was founded 72 years ago with the States of Israel. We have over 8,000 employees. 65% of them are scientists and engineers. Majority of them are Technion graduates. Now, when thinking about it, we'll go on and talk about a little bit about the technology. So when one thinks about the technology, it is hard to imagine that all of this technology that you see here on the screen are dated back to the 70s and 80s. And they were all invented in the defense companies, the internet, the GPS, virtual reality, and many, many more, almost 40 and 50 years old. Nowadays, we can see a huge burst of inventions and innovations in all the areas, such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, quantum communication, 3D printings, and many more. These technologies affect our lives every single day. Now, at the beginning of this decade, we had Siri that was invented in DARPA, defense company, in the 90s, and Alexa, they were the first AI personal assistant application. Google first driving car, for example. But once we master this technology, we start facing some challenges with the use. For example, artificial intelligence that is bullying humans or misinformation that become a real threat to our own privacy. Now, technology by itself is not good or bad. Technology can give you cancer and technology can cure your cancer. So it's all about whether technology, it's not about whether technology is good or bad, it's about what we decide to do with the technologies. And I want to show you what we are doing in Raphael's in terms of artificial intelligence. And the best way for me is to talk a little bit about Iron Dome. Now, for those of you who never heard about it, well, it is an all weather mobile air defense system that was declared operational in 2011. At that time, the system was able to handle several different threats. Nine years later, and without changing even a single part in the hardware, the system can address a significantly high number of different threats with much higher capacity. How are we doing it? Well, we change only the software and not the hardware. So let me show you. Well, if you look at the operational scenario, the system is facing an array of unknown threats. We don't know their launch points. We don't know their launch angle. The data from the sensor that you see here in yellow on the right is partial, segmented, and quite noisy. Now, 
the data we use it to estimate the location and the speed of the threats. But normally the accuracy is not that efficient for the right interception rate. In addition to the estimation process, it has to be completed in a matter of seconds, way beyond the capability of the human operator. So Iron Dog is in fact an artificial intelligence machine. It can handle large volume of tag and untag data of this threat, to classify them into different families, and then it can respond correctly as needed, faster than human. So you can see how to use artificial intelligence inside defense system. Now we use our technology expertise also to benefit the community around us. For example, we connect, we cooperate with the Alin Hospital for Disabled Children in Jerusalem, trying to solve the day-to-day -day problems and difficulties. Using our core technologies in electro-optics and communication, those kids can now play catch while sitting on the wheelchair. We have similar projects with additional volunteer organizations, such as Makers for Givers, that hold annual events to address the daily problem of wounded veterans from around the world. Well, we use our technology also in many other areas. I'm sure some of you heard about PILCAM that I'm holding here in my hand. Let me get it closer to you. Well, it's a capsule that contains a miniature video camera that records images captured while passing through our digestion system. Actually, this is a spin-off of Raphael core technology in electro-optical missile seeker head. So think about it. You're swallowing the head of a missile in that respect. So I'll just go to my final word of this short presentation is that we live in really an exciting time. This is for me, it's the age of wonders in technology. Very soon we will see self-driving cars, computers that understand and communicate with us, and many, many more new and exciting developments. We can benefit from them. We can enjoy this technology. We just have to keep our mind open and let our imagination flow. This is the time of the technology and the only advice I can give you where you're going to choose your next subject to study is get ready for it. Thank you, David. Uh, initially, that I never thought that I could swallow missiles and still live to talk about it. Uh, so uh, our next guest is Oscar, the founder of CEO of Maxillary Technologies, a company that addresses hard computing challenges with both software and custom hardware, including semiconductors. Oscar was born in Austria, near where Theodor Herzl lived. In addition to the Technion, he studied at Stanford and quite a few other places and came to London for Imperial. Oscar is also into sports, an avid skier and, pre and represented the UK in table tennis competitions. Maybe he deserves an entry into the shortest book in the world, which is, I'm sure you all know, Jewish sport legends. When I met Oscar, he told me he managed to finish the Technion with the highest distinction in two years instead of the normal four. Well, I've done quite a few th difficult things in my life, but for me, the Technion was one of the hardest with a huge amount of work and no time off. So two years instead of four, I was impressed and I thought he was a bit odd. Then he told me that he really enjoyed the experience and for a moment, I thought he was an alien. So I spent on our first meeting six hours with him, went to his office, spoke, and now I can verify not only that he's human, but he's one of the nicest people I know. So here's to you, Oscar. Let's hear your story. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, now this is going to be very hard to uh, to live up to. Um, so so I um, I was thinking hard about what it is that that I could say at an event to to uh, people who are looking at uh, science and technology as a career. For me, it was never a question. Um, as long as, as I can remember, uh, this is a picture from, from when I was uh, 11 years old. 
um, I knew that, that I would be doing science and technology. Um, I, for some reason or another, got a, a little computer, as you can see here, a, a Sinclair Spectrum, which may have been a uh, um, sign that, that I might end up uh, in the UK at some point. And, and I fell in love with, with the idea, with the, with the little box that would make my television do things that I could not explain, I could not understand. I had no idea how this little box could create all of the magic that I can see on my television. The, the need and the, the desire to understand how it works was driving me since then. And I believe also today that the most important part of picking a career in science and technology is the urge, the need to understand. If you look around in the world and you want to know how things work, you want to know why something happens, how exactly it gets to be where it is. Um, that's a career in science, technology, um, engineering, uh, and, and all the related fields. So, so this was uh, my uh, beginning as, as a little boy, and, and that led me also to, to get to the Technion. Um, David mentioned that I enjoyed the experience. It was, of course, very difficult, but the enjoyment ar arose from the understanding and the love for the subject. All of the professors I met uh, and most of the students really enjoyed and loved the subject that, that they were uh, studying and that they were teaching and that they were working on. And that energy is very rare if you look around in many other universities, it's not the same. Uh, you have people who go to work, they have a job, they, they do something, but it's about the communication and the teaching of excitement about the field, why it is great to do something where the Technion really shines on all of the fronts. Almost any professor at the Technion that I met has inspired me in, in one way or the other. And Technion graduates have been inspiring me uh, when I meet them uh, ever since. Uh, here is an example of, of an uh, inspiring uh, project that uh, I was working on. Um, one of the superpowers that, that of course all of us would like to have, or at least have uh, thought about it at some point during our childhood, is to look through walls, to do something that is otherwise impossible. And we call that in science, we call it imaging. Um, and we can use mathematics, we can use thinking and algorithms and computers to not just look through walls, but we can look into the earth. This is an example of uh, earth imaging where we can look underneath the earth and find things without digging the hole, without actually going there. And then you can see here how, how the waves propagate through this. Of course, uh, I'm, I'm not a physicist. Um, I build a computer for it. So, so we built a special supercomputer just for looking into the earth. And we built the whole thing and deployed it and had people actually use it to look underground and find things. What you see here is a little castle with, uh, with a few guys running around in the top of the earth. And underneath you see a salt body. So the dark green thing is a big chunk of salt that you can see under the earth uh, that geophysicists and people who like to look under the earth are excited about because it tells them what else may be around that salt body, where water might be, where oil might be, where other resources might, might be hidden, where we can go and find them. So, so this is for me uh, the equivalent of the childhood dream of looking through a wall uh, but there is more to understand about the world. And so I was digging deeper all the way at the bottom of, of the deepest, deepest secrets of the universe. You find quarks, uh, which have been, uh, of course, uh, discovered uh, now uh, probably 60 years ago by uh, Jerry Friedman. And um, he was told that it is impossible. And he sat there and ran an experiment on a particle accelerator that was forbidden by the authorities of that particle accelerator. And he had to lie to them and he ran it anyway. 
and he found the, the substructure of particles. And of course, uh, uh, the, the, the rest is then history. So from my side, I built a supercomputer here that calculates the simulations of these quarks moving around, interacting with each other, forces acting onto each other. And you can build a special computer just for that and build a supercomputer out of that, deliver it to the National Supercomputing Center and, and do great things with it contribute to the understanding of the fabric of space and time, which is, which is just uh, one of the most uh, uh, exciting things that, that I think uh, we've done with, with the computers that, that we've built. Um, and finally, of course, as you have a career in science and, and engineering, it's not just sitting in the laboratory. You get to build machines and you get to put them places. And so just having a picture, seeing one of the greatest supercomputers in the world, an IBM Blue Gene, and knowing that, that we have uh, a, a supercomputer that, that I've designed myself, built from the ground up, from the transistors all the way to the software and whatever runs on it. And this particular one on the right was used for brain simulations, for simulating parts of the brain, a part that's called the cerebellum, where we do all kinds of exciting things when, when we think about stuff. And then finally, of course, uh, you build stuff and you put in places, you may end up meeting interesting people and hearing about their challenges and problems. Uh, and uh, of course, the, there is no end to the challenges and problems that, that the two people were facing uh, after I met with them here on the picture on, on the left, uh, which uh, we, we should probably not get into further. So, so with that, I'll, I'll leave it to, to Michael to, uh, to, to inspire us next. Oscar, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. I hope uh, you will have a picture with me in your next presentation. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Michael Bronstein. My Michael has managed to combine an academic career in parallel with entrepreneurship. Born in Russia, in the town of Tula, near Moscow, he moved to Israel at the age of 10. Tula in Russian terms is near Moscow, but in Israel terms is the length of the country, is as far as Russian cries from Ashdod. So everything is relative, I suppose. Michael studied at the Technion and is now the chair of machine learning at Imperial College. And in parallel, he works for Twitter as head of graph learning research. He has authored 150 papers, wrote a book with a catchy title, Numerical Geometry of Non-Rigid Shapes, and holds 30 patents. I think he maybe have written one, uh, you know, the last half an hour or something. He's a serial entrepreneur. I counted four companies, one of which was acquired by Intel and the other by Twitter. So when I heard that Michael was involved in SETI, I thought Michael was spending time in the desert, sitting on antennas and listening for aliens. In fact, he was in a totally different program, a different SETI much closer to home, but with a similar goal, listening to creatures much closer to us, whales, and trying to understand their language using modern artificial intelligent techniques. With partners such as the National Geographic Society, he will attempt for the first time in history to have a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue, with a non-human species. So that's where the squishy finger soft robotics were delicate. So we don't want to harm the whales. I think that's, that's the main, uh, that's the main nature. So here's to you, Michael, and let's hear your story. Thank you very much. So it's really a pleasure to be here, especially with, uh, with uh, such great speakers. Uh, so um, basically I'm also a Technion graduate. I uh, did all my three degrees at the Technion, uh, basically a bachelor uh, in electrical engineering and then a PhD in computer science. So I didn't finish in two years. It took me uh, four years to, to finish my undergraduate studies. And actually, I remember it was pretty hard. Then I discovered that I misread uh, the, the, the program requirements. And actually, I took extra courses that were probably would be sufficient for a double degree. And uh, that was really a very unfortunate mistake. But uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I always liked what uh, I've been doing. So I think for me as well, it's for, for Oscar. Uh, uh, it has never been a question what I wanted to do, so I was always uh, uh, interested in technology and science and how things work. And I think computer science really uh, gives you 
uh, both the the, uh, the the tangible thing you can you can build things like like computers like like, like Oscar is doing, but also the theoretical part. So I, I mostly work on machine learning, different aspects of it. I uh, I was also involved in several startups. I found several startups myself uh, together with my students and other colleagues. Uh, with my former PhD advisor from from Technion, that that uh, is uh, not only uh, basically not, not not only a scientific uh, advisor but also a, a good friend and, and commercial partner. So uh, uh, we started with uh, actually the the, uh, the work with him was uh, um, quite uh, started on on, the, on an interesting note that that. Uh, I was I have a twin brother and uh, we're sitting in his course and probably we we. We got excited about some some argument in his lecture, and he said that usually uh, he uh, kicks out students that disturb out uh, out of his classroom. And uh, basically, then uh, we're really upset. Then, then he gave us a, a challenging problem. We were managed to solve it, and that was um, the beginning of my research in uh, face recognition. So we designed a three uh, three dimensional face recognition system. That, that was able to, to tell us apart. Basically, that was a, a challenge at that time. Nowadays, uh, face recognition might be a trivial technology almost, but uh, almost 20 years ago, that was not straightforward at all, and especially with uh, three-dimensional data. So we tried actually to commercialize it, and uh, probably rightfully, investors were telling us that this is not interesting because uh, you, you don't really have sensors. Uh, that would acquire 3D data. So we decided to build a center. That was uh, the first company that was successful that, uh, that, that I was involved in, that was called Envision, uh, based in Israel. It was acquired by Intel and uh, uh, I joined Intel part-time together with my academic work and we developed uh, one of the first uh, 3D sensors that could be embedded into, uh, into laptops and tablets. So I have one of the incarnations of this uh, thing here. So this is actually the, the second or probably third generation that is actually a micro lighter. So this is some uh, like the big systems that you get in self-driving cars that, that we, we've mentioned, but this is miniaturized so you can really put it into a smart device, a smart phone or a drone, uh, and uh, it allows to acquire the, the 3D world around it. So around that time, so basically I was working on geometry and geometry, usually you, when you think of geometry, it's geometry of three dimensional objects, right? So things that like, I don't know, solid uh, volumes and, and, and uh, different things that, that you, can, you can touch, but you can also think of geometry as a very abstract science, uh, mathematical abstraction trying to represent uh, relations uh, between things. And one of the ways of doing it is in the form of what is called graphs. So this is an abstraction that, that uh, model systems of relations and interactions. And um, in the past five or six years, we've been working on trying to do uh, machine learning uh, uh, techniques on uh, graph structure data. And um, that's how I got interested in social networks. And in particular, the problem of fake news that, well, is still not solved. And especially around the, the presidential elections, it uh, was a, a very big uh, issue and a real threat to democracy. So we tried to see if our methods uh, uh, would be any good for uh, trying to automatically detect fake news on social networks. And uh, that was a company I founded with my students that was called Fabula. It was actually based here in the UK. That was already uh, after time when I moved to the UK and joined Imperial College. Uh, we were acquired about a year ago by Twitter. And that's how I ended up uh, at Twitter, hitting uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the machine learning research uh, in, in graphs there. So Twitter, as you know, is basically a social network. It's a huge graph uh, with uh, hundreds of millions of users and billions of connections. It's a graph that is changing all the time. Basically, it, uh, it follows the trends and the, 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 what people are talking about, what people are concerned about. So it's really a very important resource and understanding it, making it a better and safer platform is, is extremely important. So we're trying to develop these uh, techniques, not only to detect fake news, but also make uh, better recommended systems, also make uh, 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 other systems that, that uh, basically work under the hood that you actually never see, but they make uh, the difference between a good or a bad experience on a social network. So I should say basically in retrospective, whether uh, I think this is really the best job that uh, that you can you can dream of, and uh, as a computer scientist, as as, as an academic, as a professor, as a, a technological um, entrepreneur, I uh, I get exposed to a lot of different problems. 
So you don't really work on a single thing. You meet people that you probably otherwise will, will never meet. So uh, during my career, and especially working on machine learning problems, I uh, was working with uh, theoretical physicists and particle physicists that run the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory on the, uh, on the, in, in the South Pole. This is a cubic uh, uh, kilometer detector that, that is uh, buried under the ice and detects neutrinos, probably one of the most elusive and mysterious particles in the world. So, uh, well, I guess I, uh, here I also uh, have, uh, I can connect to Oscar uh, how uh, uh, interesting this is and to read, well, with her background in, in astrophysics. Uh, I've been working with biologists and uh, 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 protein scientists, so we uh, use machine learning algorithms to design proteins. Proteins, as you know, well, it's not only the, the thing that you, uh, that you drink after you go to the gym, but it's basically the molecule of life. That's, uh, we don't know any form of life currently that is not based on proteins. So proteins power everything in our body, in the in, in body of every living thing. And uh, for example, if you want to, to develop the next generation cure against cancer, one of the key problems is how you design a drug that will bind to certain proteins and will deactivate certain uh, oncological processes. So basically, I, uh, I work with, with these people that actually build these proteins in the lab and then can deploy them in a clinical setting. I work with, uh, uh, with a chef, with a molecular gastronomy chef, that basically we, we had research on uh, how to detect uh, uh, drug-like molecules in food. So you can, next dish will be customized so to your genetic profile and you will be eating only the, the right stuff that will uh, prevent or even cure diseases. Uh, and the Wales project is, uh, that was, uh, this is probably the craziest project I've been involved in. It sounds uh, extremely challenging and it is extremely challenging. Basically we want to find uh, language patterns in bioacoustic uh, communication of whales, of sperm whales in particular. So these are, uh, creatures that live underwater, uh, there, it's very little that is known about them. They communicate in clicks. So it's like Morse code. So they use clicks for echolocation. They use it to communicate. These are animals of the extreme. So they're big like a school bus. They, have, they produce the loudest animal sound that is known on Earth. So they can kill prey, they can kill a human with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, their, with their speech. And yet they're very gentle creatures and unlike the beliefs, if, don't believe in Moby Dick. There is uh, never any uh, any documented evidence that, that sperm whales have ever attacked humans. Uh, uh, they are very intelligent. They have the largest mammal brain in the world. And uh, if we were to, to, to find any intelligent life that is uh, close to humans and has a, a system of communication that is, uh, that, that is close to us, it will probably be there underwater. So I know that aliens might be more exciting, but uh, we have aliens that are living on our planet and share the, the environment with us. We just need to, to observe them, to listen to them more carefully. And probably also uh, this will give us uh, probably a better idea that we are not alone and we should take better care of our planet. At this point, I think I will pass it back to you, David. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you very much. I, will, I think I will keep the sentence uh, that, that you can kill a human with their speech. I think I know a few humans that can do that as well, but uh, you know, let's keep it for, for another time. So thank you uh, uh, very much. Um, now we, we're coming to the open discussion uh, session where we will all appear hopefully on the same screen. And um, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, first one that came is, is for, for Irit. And I know it's a question that uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a dilemma whether to, to address it for too, for too long, but I think we should. Uh, what is your experience as a female in the technology field? And in, in my time, at least uh, the, in the Technion, there were very few women, uh, maybe 10% or 15%, which was like much, much lower than, than obviously that, that, that you would expect. I don't know if this has improved, but I think this starting from even school and going to, to, to the university, if you can tell us a few, a few words about it. Well, uh, thanks, David. Well, the number has changed. It's not 10%, but it's definitely not 50% of all students in the Technion that are women, unfortunately. And it does start very, at a very early age. And at least for me, 
when I rem remember myself as a child, I always enjoy being around boys much more than being around girls. So I always looked for challenges. And I never felt different being a woman or a female doing what I did. I went to study in uh, Ort High School and I studied electronics. And then I went to the Israeli Navy and I was the first woman that was a missile technician in the Israeli Navy. And then when I went to study physics, it was just obvious for me because I wanted to study astrophysics. And I had fun. And I think the one thing I can tell everyone, all those young people that listen to us today, is just do what you love to do. Enjoy what you want to do. And I'm having just an amazing time every day waking up and every day is different than the one that was before. And every day I have new puzzle, new rhythm, something that I have to solve. And I'm enjoying life. And it doesn't matter where you are, female or a male. Just have fun. Technology is there for us. I think, if, I think, I think the question also refers uh, to whether you faced any kind of obstacles uh, as well as... Uh, um, you know, opportunities uh, in, in, in this particular uh, field, uh, because, you know, we all know that this, this problem exists. Yeah, it does exist. Well, I can tell you that during my first year in Raphael, I was working with explosive. So I remember going into those laboratory where there were men that working on those explosive and the walls were covered with pictures from magazines that you can imagine. And they looked at me and I went, well, here comes this young woman from the Technion and she is going to teach us what she wants to do. And with time, when they learn to respect me and to realize that I know what I'm talking about, those pictures from the walls came down. I didn't have to say a word because it showed me their respect. So it's all the way on how you want to explain yourself, how you want to express yourself. I always had confidence. And I think this is one of the things I'm trying now working with girls. I want them to go and study science and math. And we have great projects to have more women in the Technion and both in high schools. It all comes to the fact, trust yourself, trust your instincts. Fantastic. Uh, to Michael, as a question about uh, Fabula, uh, what conclusions or discoveries have you made about fake news and how it spreads on social networks? I think I've heard something about it already. Yeah, well, so I think uh, basically we observed a lot of interesting phenomena. I, I would point to one of them. Uh, there is huge polarization. So it's not, we're probably not the first one, uh, ones to see it. We, uh, it, it has been observed before, but we probably were the first to see it in the context of fake news. Basically, if you, uh, uh, there are parallel universes, people that read one sort of news and people that read another sort of news and they don't communicate with each other. So there is a big gap, big, big disconnect that probably to some extent explains why basically we see such uh, uh, radicalized and, and uh, uh, such radicalization around certain topics uh, in the United States in particular. So uh, um, basically, uh, uh, yeah, basically people are not listening to, 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 to each other. So they live in their uh, isolated worlds. I think uh, you once uh, mentioned that, uh, that uh, it's the, the problem is becoming harder. Uh, you know, you, the problem you solved is is not uh, the same that is uh, being as it's evolving is that a moving target i think it's it's a moving target and uh, it would be very uh, probably very arrogant to say that it's uh, just a technological problem we can solve it with machine learning or with other methods i think it's more uh, uh, basically the finger should be pointed to ourselves to the society it's uh, uh, it's our problem basically the, the data is created by humans. We can try to find some patterns in this data, but it's eventually us who are creating the problem. So we should uh, uh, ask us the hard questions, uh, basically how that we, we, we got to this point. 
Okay, the next question I think uh, is, uh, is one that you somehow uh, addressed uh, uh, Michael already and it's open for everybody, but I think Michael touched upon it and also Oscar, uh, but indirectly any of it, uh, but that was indirectly. There's a question about uh, when someone wants to have a PhD uh, and they want to have an impact and they, there's a concern of being over specialized and not not uh, you know the, because you know multidisciplinary interests are need to be uh, taken into account you mentioned uh, michael and it's obvious for from everybody that today's systems a systems approach is very important uh, there is not one technology that can on its own uh, survive which is uh, something that you know we can even expand uh, romantically into, into, into the human sphere, of course. But if we stay in technology, how can you, you know, the choice between deep and wide of knowing a little of, of, of many different subjects or going deep to one of them, uh, how would you solve that? Maybe, Oscar, you want to say something about it. You have so many projects, yeah. so many different projects. I'm, um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I think... I think um, it's a matter of perspective. Uh, when, when you're very young, uh, you look at the PhD as something that takes an infinite amount of time. As you get older, you realize that a PhD is a very short amount of time. It's just a few years and you get to do something, right? And so your perspective before your PhD is, wow, I'm going to spend a quarter of my life or, or a third or, or maybe a bit less of my life, 10% of my life doing something. Oscar, you did the technical in two years. years. You did the technical in two years. Did you do your PhD in one and a half? Uh, no, no, I, I, I enjoyed doing that a bit longer. But um, what, uh, what is important is that a complete person in, in the professional world of science and technology has to have both. You have to have depth in something and you have to have the breadth. And you need to work on both of these at the same time in parallel. While you're doing your PhD and you're becoming an expert in something, you also need to keep up with all of the other things broadly so you know a little bit about lots of things. And so it's, it's more about picturing the ideal science and energy, uh, uh, engineering person as being T-shaped and developing your own T-shape in the shape that, that you want it to be. But uh, definitely a PhD is not a lifetime of specialization. It is three years out of hopefully a 50 year career. So you're talking about 5% of, of your career being invested at the beginning to start building your teeth. And you can build multiple T's at, uh, later on. But that, that's how I would answer that. Pick one. Don't worry about it. Do that. You can do something else after you're finished with it. But try to finish one set of activities, a set of work, a complete piece of contribution to, to humanity, which is a PhD thesis. And then you can do another 20 after that and they won't be called a PhD, they will be called projects and, and little bits of things that, that you work on. Um, and you can have fun going through lots of different things once you've done your first one. Thank you. So I, I, I yeah. To this, uh, so I, I completely agree. I think uh, um, basically a PhD, of course, you solve the problem. And actually there is a saying that as an undergraduate, uh, uh, you think that, that, uh, that you know a lot, as a master's student, you see that you you don't know a lot. As a PhD student, you see how much your PhD advisor doesn't know. So basically, I, it's it's mostly not about obviously about making impact and about about uh, learning new things and, and advancing science, but it's also meta learning. It's learning how to solve problems, how to do independent research. And uh, do am I working on the same topics I did uh, in my PhD 15 years ago? Of course not. And it has changed, but it gave me the skills to solve other problems. And science moves and you move and you get new interests and you meet new people, you, 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 you work on new ideas. So you have a lot of projects that probably I've done other projects that would easily qualify as other PhDs. Of course, I, I, I cannot get another one or, or, or 
or another two or another three, it doesn't really matter. So it gives you, it gives you these meta skills. And I should say, this is probably the most blissful time in, uh, uh, in, in my life. So for me, it was basically a no brainer. It was a, just a continuation. And the only thing I regret, I actually finished in the year and a half to do my first startup. I wish it lasted four years as it normally lasts. Oh, I completely agree with both of you. And I think the beauty about it is, is when you're combining things together and then you enhance your feelings. And I just want to quote Albert Einstein when someone asked him years ago, when he's studying the universe, doesn't it make him feel smaller? And he says, on the contrary, I'm a large as my knowledge is. So the beauty about this is when you combine things, when you learn, when you are not afraid to challenge yourself, you're just going to improve yourself and enjoy it. Thank you. Ethan is asking uh, a very classical question, of course, uh, looking ahead uh, over the next, let's say, 20 years. Which technology do you think is going to be the single most disruptive to one to our current way of life? If you can pick one, I suppose it's a very difficult. It's almost impossible yeah. to choose one. <laughs> there is a first of everything that is happening nowadays, so it's really very difficult to choose one. Digital health will definitely be a subject of technology that will change in the next future and it's going to have artificial intelligence, but quantum computer is coming nearby. So gosh, so many new and interesting things. I'm just looking forward for it. Yes, I think um, the digital health is exactly right, Irit. Um, many professions are going to change very dramatically. I think uh, medical doctors, the way we know them are going to be part of of ancient history. Uh, medicine is going to change fundamentally from the ground up uh, as soon as we, we have a generational change to doctors who know how to use a computer. Um, we already see a few of them knowing how to use a computer, but we really have to, have to go a whole generation to do that. And in many other professions as well, once we have the new generation that has grown up on Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, and, and other platforms, and they ter take over the majority of our professions. Um, policemen, fire, uh, medicine, uh, all of these things are going to change. Our whole society is going to change. But I think, personally, the biggest impact is going to come from biology. We have uh, become the masters of of uh, digital computers, technology, electrical. Uh, we know how to move electrons left and right any way we want. Once we raise one, one level up and we become the masters of biology and we can create, modify, engineer, and change biological systems any way that we want, I think that's going to be the most disruptive of, of any change. The question is just if we can do that in 20 years or we need a bit more time. So I, I, I second, uh, it's actually interesting that uh, it's probably the first time when uh, I participate in such a panel and all speakers agree about the future. I, uh, this is what I also want to say. I think healthcare is, uh, uh, is probably the, the, the major impact on uh, everybody's life. We can, of course, there are other things like quantum computing, et cetera, that will have an impact, but this is really something that affects everyone. And today's healthcare is really not healthcare, it's sick care. We, yes. we, we, we treat uh, people that are already diagnosed with a disease when in many cases it's too late. So first of all, uh, basically uh, high throughput imaging uh, technologies, which are already happening. They are not just not being harnessed completely. We are droning in data. So the, the biological research produces more data that we can analyze. So with the help of machine learning, we'll be able to better understand actually how our body works. We'll be able to design drugs in a completely different way. This is already happening. It's probably five to 10 years uh, uh, milestone. Uh, the way that drugs are currently being designed, it's about $2 billion in 10 years of uh, uh, getting to market and about 3% really get uh, through all the clinical trials and approvals. Uh, and uh, if we're able to, to, to to, to change the way the drugs are designed. People have been talking about personalized medicine 
forever. Uh, the food that we eat, for example, contains uh, drug-like molecules. If we are able to personalize nutrition, uh, uh, again, not to, not to cure diseases, but to prevent diseases, if we're able to collect data from biometric sensors, so the, the Apple Watch, for example, that, well, uh, it, it has a very trivial sensors nowadays, but imagine five years from now, it will be collecting the data on billions of people 24 hours, seven, uh, uh, seven days a week. Uh, you can get a lot of uh, uh, insights from this data. Imagine now uh, genetic sequencing. So this is already reality. Now for less than $1,000, you can uh, produce your full genome and uh, there are already interesting insights that, that are done from uh, genome-wide association studies at large scale. Uh, so this will probably 20 years from now, this will be completely common. Of course, there are many concerns about privacy and, uh, and ethics of this, but uh, if we are able to, to honestly discuss them and address them, I think the sky is the limit. It's pretty amazing that you all agreed on that. I mean, I wouldn't have guessed. I would have thought you would have said uh, something with artificial intelligence. Of course, you are using artificial intelligence to solve a health, uh, a health tech problem. Uh, and without it, it's a tool. And that's what I say to people when they say to me, what do you want to study? I said, computers is a tool. And if you're not really crazy about a new you know, kind of algorithm, do something else and use computers to improve it. So I think that uh, that's, a, that's an amazing uh, con con congruence you have here in, in, in this uh, agreeing that health tech, healthcare will be the one that will be revolutionize our lives. Uh, if, I, if we wanted to ask uh, again, all of you, um, Irit has a, an experience in working with a large budget and, uh, and developing things, having a budget and uh, what if we want to compare it with uh, startups that want to that need uh, to get funding almost you know immediately uh, be, to survive? I, I mean, how do we compare this experience? Uh, is it that more, that that much easier, or, or actually it's more difficult because it's more bureaucratic in a large company? Irit, maybe you can try to attempt that. There is no, there's no problem in that respect. If you are a startup, there are many ways to really finance yourself. There are, at least in Israel, lots of VC companies that's looking for new startups and the good ideas. There's the innovation authority in Israel that would like, well, we are working a lot of, um, with startup in all respects in the health and the cybersecurity uh, in Israel. So actually, the whole idea is to have this really great idea of whether it's invention or innovation it doesn't matter you have to follow your heart and you'll find a way um, to finance it fantastic and anyone else you want to contribute uh, otherwise i will ask uh, i will ask this question to oscar uh because you know you i think you've been in more universities than uh, than, than than the rest how does the technion compare to the other universities? Oh, that's, uh, that's a great question for me. I, I, I really like that question um, because, uh, because I think that the Technion is really underrated in, on, on the world stage. Uh, I think uh, especially in the UK, but also in the US, the, the rankings of universities are very skewed towards uh, local national feelings, um, while at the same time, uh, if Israel wanted to rank all of its universities, uh, there's not much to rank because there's very few of them compared to 3,000 universities in the US. Um, but from a quality perspective, um, having gone through uh, um, the uh, European uh, academic environment through uh, a Technion degree, through many different US universities, having spent a lot of time at Stanford, but also given lectures occasionally at, at MIT and Harvard and, and other places. I think the Technion is absolutely on par with the top three or four universities in the US in the field that, uh, that uh, the Technion is strong in, which is basic science and uh, technology computer science, uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Um, and it becomes quite evident from the personal relationships, of course, of, of uh, Technion professors with these top 
institutions, uh, almost every professor at the Technion has a uh, second leg either at Stanford or at Berkeley or at MIT, and, and they're always welcome to go back and forth. Um, and so I would say that the Technion is not just one of the world's top institutions, but has proven itself as one of the top institutions by producing the companies to back it up. It's very nice and easy to say, ah, oh, they're very smart and they're doing a great job. You go to the lecture, you really enjoy yourself. But you can look back at the last 20 years, 25 years um, since I graduated, it's now 25 years. And it's just phenomenal. There is uh, no university in the world that, that had such a steep exponential climb. Uh, Stanford was already there and then did many different things. MIT was already established. Uh, but the Technion came out of almost nowhere and uh, built up a, uh, a competitor to, to Silicon Valley that nobody who was in Israel in the 70s or 80s or 90s even could have ever imagined. And so that, that all came out of the, the powerhouse. And of course, there's other universities as well. The Weizmann Institute is a fantastic place. And, uh, Tel Aviv is a good place. So, so there are many different good universities, but for me personally, the Technion is, is very close to my heart and uh, has really proven itself over these uh, last few decades as one of the top institutions in the world. Oscar, thank you very much. Anyone, if, if anyone wants to add something uh, on that, uh, welcome. But I think you, you uh, totally uh, said the right thing and praised the, in the right sort of way. I think today we had a focus on computer science, uh, two out of three at least, and physics is not far from, from, from that. Uh, but hopefully we should have more sessions and invite uh, other disciplines to join uh, for the Technion and talk about this, their, their successes. High tech is lucrative. I mean, I personally call it the revenge of the nerds, you know, because, you know, in my, when I was growing up and I was, I was a child, you know, the rich people, the successful people were in finance, in uh, property, and, and I think uh, the world has changed since then. As in every domain, Jewish minds and Israeli ingenuity is holding an inordinate percentage of success. Google, Facebook, WhatsApp, Snapchat, Raphael, Maxeller, Fabula, all are Jewish and Israeli companies. So I hope you take the right decisions. And from this group that participated today, I hope to see the next Sergey, Larry, Mark, Jan, Michael, Irit, and Oscar. But mostly, I hope you have as much fun as they do doing that, having that. So thank you very much, the panelists, and thank you all. We will stay on, whoever wants to stay, we will have some, uh, some uh, polls. But I want to thank the panelists uh, very much for taking this uh, time and participate in this event. Great. Thanks. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.